So now you got some fucking idiot calling you up every two days. How's it going? And you're like, oh, great. Have you been getting high lately? No, never. That sucks when you got to lie to those people. They're not really sponsors. They're just maybe like a cousin or a fucking a friend of a friend that, you know, he got sober and now he wants to help you. Those poor bastards. I must have gone through 10 of those motherfuckers when they call you up. Hi, I'm friends with Michael Klein and I've been clean for 14 months. I want to help you. And you talk to them. I tell you who really tried to help me get off coke. And I forget what his name is now. Mikey DiStefano. You ever hear Mikey DiStefano? Comedian? Mm-hmm. He passed away? God rest his soul. He passed yeah. away. He's friends with somebody. Uh, Jerry Rocha. Yeah. Jerry Roach and him were great friends. And, I, I, you know, there were so many people who tried to fucking would pull me aside. There was one dude, Claude Shy, is fucking dynamite. He was friends with Kelly Kirsten and Jimmy Shoe. But when I got to California in 98, 99, 2000, 2002, I remember he would talk to me. And then one day he just went full command on He's like, this is what's going on. I'm going to pick you up. I'm going to drop you off at Betty Ford Clinic. I'm going to pay for it when you get out and get a job and get famous. He would always say that to me. When you get famous, you could pay me back. And I'm like, listen, I'm not going to fucking Betty Ford. But <laughs> if you lend me 100 bucks, I could fucking go. Like I, I went through all those guys. And I, and I pray for them now, and I feel bad. And I'm happy that they did what they did. I just wasn't ready yet. Chris Stefano was probably the last guy that him and I were having man-to-man -man conversations on the phone. Mike DiStefano. Yeah, Mikey. Mikey DiStefano. His brothers live in North Bergen, I think, still. Good family. Good fucking dude. Funny motherfucker. God rest his soul. You know, he got locked up like me. Him and I had uh, a lot of similar stories, and I think Jerry hooked us up. And I still remember. He was the closest guy that got me. His, I... I I say a prayer for him once a week on Mondays, Mikey. I think about him a lot because Mikey talked me into, like, the Hollywood free rehab. Like, Hollywood has a free rehab, and I went to it a couple times. Like, I, I joined up. I had to give him my license. His name is Jose Diaz, whatever. And then I would go for a week, and then, and this is 2000, guys, 2001, 2002. I'll never forget going in there. And having a great time and talking. I was going to the to the groups. They would piss you once a week. So I was still at the level where I was going backwards. Like they piss you the first time. And now all your piss sets have to come under that level. But I just was like, okay. And I I think that I, I stayed sober for like a week or two. And then I went to, because you have to go to meetings three times a week. It was like five AA meetings. And three group meetings in Hollywood, right there. It was right there by a smoothie place I used to go to. And then one day, some guy goes, hey, man, I went to the comedy store and saw you the other night. Weren't you there late night? And I'm like, no, that wasn't me. And I'm like, and dog, I fucking got out of there, and I was embarrassed because I didn't want nobody knowing. Listen, everybody knew I had a drug problem, but I didn't know nobody. I, I didn't want anybody coming up to me and trying to be fucking, you know, Johnny AA at the comedy store. <laughs> So when I went to get help, I didn't want nobody to find out I was trying to get help. That's the last thing I wanted is fucking help. Last thing I wanted was to get the other day somebody came uh, a friend of mine came over here. He's in he's in uh the program and he was we were good guy, cop, good fucking dude. He's he's a drinker. And we were talking about this comedian that he goes, I saw this comedian that's drug free and he did a show. Good guy, I forget what his name is now, I knew him. When he was kind of, I go, that dude's a good dude, and he has great material about AAs and shit, but I remember I had to follow him in a couple clubs. Like, he would come in, and I'd come in the week after him, and the club would go, thank God you were here last this week. We had a week of fucking AA people in this motherfucker drinking coffee. All we sold was coffee and fucking, you know, a couple orders of wings because AA people were used to going to the meetings so when they would do a show, the clubs would do a show with this guy, they knew they weren't going to get it too high at a minimum, so they just raised the prices up 10 bucks. And they were like, you know, they're happy to be out. The guy does an hour on fucking... Uh, and, but that I, I still remember I bring him up because I remember 
thinking, if I stop doing fucking coke, that's going to take the crazy away from me, and I'm not going to be funny anymore. And that was the reason why I never quit coke all those fucking years. I was petrified that my edge was going to disappear, that I wouldn't be crazy anymore. I was fucking wrong, you know. We were always wrong. You're still going to keep what you fucking have. But anyway, back to Torrey fucking pow. How do we get on going to fucking rehab in Hollywood? <laughs> I love I love all this shit, though, when the podcast goes awry, you know what I'm saying? And you're just talking from the fucking heart on a beautiful Monday morning in fucking New Jersey, Jack. It's, uh, yeah, the prison changed my fucking life, man. And it should, but I tell you, it doesn't work for a lot of people. And when you look at the recidivism rate of, you know, doing another crime, it's horrible. Like, people who've gone to prison, they have percentages that'll make your fucking head spin. Like, you won't fucking believe it. And that's why I worked so hard, because I didn't want to fall into that pattern of being in and out of prison every three, four, five fucking years and then ending up there for the rest of your goddamn life. That wasn't going to be me. But by watching Oz these last two or three fucking weeks, I got to be honest with you, I'm, I'm happy that I got locked up. And as bad as that sound, as retarded as that sound, dog, it was my... And all this conversation started last week with me because of Vela. I haven't been able to get a hold of the guy I kidnapped. And it's getting under my skin a little bit. I know he takes care of his mom and, you know, he lost his job and shit. And, and it's so weird when I take, after I got in trouble for the kidnapping, before I got sentenced, I think about how I felt about Vela. And I wanted to fucking kill him. I wanted to kill him. I wanted somebody to kill him. You know, I kept saying the victim's going to disappear. Let's not go back. I was mad at Vela for something I had done. That's the dumbest fucking thing in the world. And that's the biggest sign of fucking immaturity. After I got locked up, I saw Vela in a different fucking light. You know, at first I was mad at Vela. I went through a... a a rainbow of fucking emotions for Kent Bella. But the bottom line was that after I did that, and I, I'll never forget when I got out of prison, right before me and my ex-wife broke up, we had an argument about something, and she said to me, she looked at me in a way that she had never looked at me before, and she said, listen, like it, you know like when you're arguing with somebody and something just comes out and it slips? She goes, da 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 you know, I can't still believe that you tied up that boy. You tied up that man and had him in the corner of a room. And she caught herself. And she's like, I'm sorry. I never really meant to say it that way. And I go, no, it's okay. It's the truth. 